Hello and thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura and today we are talking about Jaws by Peter Benchley, released in 1974 and comparing it with the movie by the same name, directed by Steven Spielberg and released in 1975. And this was requested and like someone left a comment on a YouTube video requesting this. It seems like I've had this requested a number of times now, but I didn't write down the names of anyone who requested it. And when someone requests something in a YouTube comment, I really need to be better about writing down their name because it's like impossible to go back and find it. So whoever it is that requested this, I hope you are able to see this or listen to this and let me know your thoughts in the comments and I hope you enjoy my coverage. And also I just wanted to say like, we all know how iconic this movie poster is right but the book <laughs> i just love this book cover so so much so both of these are just such amazing covers and then this also takes place on amity island and i bought this shirt specifically for this video so this is what it looks like but then i didn't realize that for the video you won't even be able to see it because <laughs> it's too far down but anyway uh, i did buy this shirt in the spirit of this video so that is how into this video i am today so getting into the book review, I was hesitant to read this book because I had heard that it has some offensive content and I was worried that I would just not be able to even finish it. And it would just be another Godfather situation where that book was just so offensive that, yeah, I couldn't even finish it. So I was worried it would be like that. So that's why I just hadn't been in a rush to do this one. But honestly, this book was fantastic. <laughs> and yes, there is this whole section in the middle that has this subplot that has nothing to do with the shark and it feels kind of out of place. And you're just like, wait a minute. It, like is this Jaws right now because what is going on <laughs> but overall I was fine with that subplot and it does cause some extra drama later on between characters when they're out on the boat looking for the shark you know there's some extra tension so for the most part with that whole subplot I was fine with it and the book in general just has great suspense great characters great drama it's definitely one that I will be reading again at some point in the future and I did want to point out how this one reminded me a lot of The Mist by Stephen King which obviously Jaws came before the mist, but both deal with a small town that has like the local, local people versus the summer people. And then it's being attacked by this thing. We know it differs between the mist and Jaws, but it's being attacked by something and how this is affecting the town and the people. And then in Jaws, there is a character who says that this is God punishing them. And you have the same thing in the mist as well. So I was kind of surprised how similar those two ended up being in some ways. So I would say if you like Jaws, you should read the mist. And if you like the mist, you should read Jaws. And on to the movie review. So because I liked this book so much, as soon as I finished it, I was just so excited to see the movie, which I had never watched before. And I am happy to report that the movie did not disappoint. This was so, so amazing. And even though I had never seen this movie before, I of course knew the famous line of you're going to need a bigger boat. But aside from that and the music, that was really all I knew going into it, which apparently the you're going to need a bigger boat line. I read that that was improvised, which is just so cool, right? How many times is like an iconic movie moment you find out that the actor just did it in the spur of the moment. So that's always kind of cool. But it's also crazy that this was like Steven Spielberg's first like big movie and he was in like his mid to late 20s. I think he was like 27 or something, which is so insane. Like what? How did someone so young direct this movie and it ended up being so incredible? It's one of those things where sometimes I read stuff like that and it makes me feel like I'm not doing anything of note <laughs> with my life because... I'm in my early 30s and I haven't, you know, achieved what Steven Spielberg did when he was 27, but you know, it's all relative, right? But also this movie kickstarted John Williams' career, which he famously does a lot, famously does a lot of Steven Spielberg movies. But yeah, he is the one who came up with the Jaws soundtrack, which of course has become so iconic. And the movie does make a number of changes from the book. You know, it gets rid of some of these subplots, which we'll get into. And it even makes some changes to the ending as well. But ultimately, when it comes to which one I will be picking at the end in my book versus movie section, it is going to be a tough call because I really did love both so much. So yeah, you'll just have to stay tuned and see what I end up picking. But before we get into the details of the plot, I did want to talk about sharks. So Peter Benchley and Steven Spielberg have both since said how they regret their book and movie and for the way it caused people to see sharks. And then sharks started being hunted and killed so much after the release of this movie because people were just, they were like, oh, they're just... Uh, vengeful man eaters. So, you know, it doesn't matter if we kill them. And in a 2005 edition of this book, Peter Benchley wrote a foreword and in it he said, 
With the knowledge accumulated from dozens of expeditions and hundreds of dives and countless encounters with sharks of many kinds came the realization that I could never write Jaws today. I could never demonize an animal, especially not an animal that is much older and much more successful in its habitat than, than man is, has been, or ever will be. An animal that is vitally necessary for the balance of nature in the sea, and an animal that we may, if we don't change our destructive behaviors, extinguish from the face of the earth. And then from here on out, I will be getting into the details of the plot, which means there will be spoilers for both book and movie. So let's begin with Chief Martin Brody. So in the movie, he is a newly elected sheriff and he has just lived there since the fall. Whereas in the book, he was a local. He was born and raised in Amity Island, whereas his wife, she was an out of towner. And the out of towners kind of look down on the locals because the out of towners tend to be like the rich city folk. So his wife was like a rich, came from a rich family. And then she met and fell in love with Brody and the two of them ended up getting married. But yeah, in the movie, they both came from the city. And then in both, we also learned that Brody is scared of water, which I thought was a really nice touch. I feel like this might be uh, elaborated on more in the book, but it is mentioned in the movie as well. And as someone who is afraid of the water, I'm not scared of like creatures in the water so much. I'm just scared of drowning. <laughs> but yeah, so as someone who is scared of water, I could definitely relate to his character in that way. But yeah, in the movie, him being so new to the town is definitely used against him because when he wants to close the beaches after the first attack, the mayor and other people, like they all gather around him and tell him like, hey, you don't get it. You're new to this town, but the summer is important here. And that's how it, we last throughout the whole year based on the summer crowd. So we can't shut down the beach because that's just going to ruin the town in more ways than you understand. Whereas in the book, like I said, he was a local. So he realized the repercussions that could come from closing the beaches, but he just felt it was serious enough that he wanted to do that. He felt he should do that. But then ultimately he is manipulated by the mayor and the newspaper guy Meadows, which Meadows is a bigger character in the book, whereas in the movie, he's like not really there at all. But anyway, he ends up being manipulated by them to keep the beaches open. So he does not close them. And in both, because he doesn't close the beaches, we have the young boy, Alex, who ends up dying. And in both, the mayor wants to keep the beaches open, but it's kind of for different reasons because in the book, the mayor has mafia connections because like in the past, he had borrowed money from the mafia. And when he tried to pay them back, they were like, they wouldn't accept the money. And so it turns out the mafia had been buying up properties in Amity. And so he needs Amity to have a good summer. <laughs> that way the mafia can sell their properties for a profit. And if Amity real estate goes down, down, down because of the beaches being closed in the shark attack, then the mafia is going to be upset at the mayor and they're going to end up losing a lot of money. And obviously that will be trouble for the mayor. So that is in the book. That is why he is so persistent about like, we got to keep these beaches open. Whereas in the movie, he just wants to keep the beaches open just for, you know, to make the usual money for the town. And, you know, ultimately it still is about greed in a sense, but in the movie, it's about greed only. Whereas in the book, it's about greed, but also I think the mayor is fearful for what the mafia will do to him if they lose money. And then at the end of the book, the mayor goes to see Ellen Brody, Martin Brody's wife. And basically he tells her how like, you know, like we could have been a great couple and, you know, I think I would have made you really happy. And it seems like he's in, he's saying this because he is either about to commit suicide or he is about to just disappear in some way, right? Because the mafia is not going to make their money back. So I don't remember if it straight up says what happens, but I kind of got the implication that he was going to be killing himself. But in both, it is interesting, kind of like the mist, to see how these attacks affect the town and just the surrounding areas. <laughs> because in the book, we see that out-of-towners are coming to Amity specifically because they heard about the shark. And so rather than keeping tourists away, it almost is bringing some of them in. And then we also have the part in the movie where a ton of people are going out on the boats to try to catch this shark because there's a reward and they think they catch it, but turns out they got the wrong one. And that wasn't in the book, actually. And in the movie, we don't see the out-of-towners that show up just because they want to get a glimpse of the shark. But yeah, so those were some nice touches in both book and movie, just seeing how it affects the bigger scope of things. But to talk about Ellen Brody, so in the book, there is this whole subplot where Ellen, like I said, she's an out-of-towner, and so sometimes she feels like she's better than these locals, including her husband. And lately, they've been together for like, I don't know, 15 years or something, and she's starting to feel, feel very unhappy and unfulfilled. And this marine biologist, biologist shows up, Matt Hooper, and turns out she had dated Hooper's older brother like 10 years prior before she married Brody. And seeing Hooper just brings back all those memories, and it makes her want to feel like she's on the same level as him because he's from a rich family too. And so she decides that she wants to have a, just a one-time hookup with Matt Hooper. And so there is this cringy dinner <laughs> where she invites Hooper and all these other people over and she's just being very obvious about her interest in Hooper. And Brody is just kind of moody and getting
getting drunk while this is happening. And then the next day they meet at a restaurant, then they go to a hotel and they have sex. And Brody suspects that something is going on between Ellen and Matt Hooper, but he never does end up finding out for sure. And when they're out on the boat, like, you know, the following days to get the shark, the fact that he suspects th something of Hooper definitely causes this like drama and tension along with the drama and tension from trying to find the shark. And yeah, like I said earlier, this whole plot line with Ellen, I didn't mind it. It was kind of, like I said, it almost felt out of place because suddenly you're like, wait, this has nothing to do with the shark or like anything. Like, why are we reading this right now? Uh, but nonetheless, I didn't dislike it. However, the one thing that I think is what causes a lot of people to have issues with this section is when she and Hooper are talking about their sexual fantasies and the fantasy Ellen shares is, it, you can tell it's written by a man and for men. And it's something that I don't think any woman fantasizes about. So that was just kind of annoying and just, uh, so yeah, that was offensive and annoying. But luckily it's just like one section of the book. So it didn't ruin it for me entirely. But anyway, Ellen, she's not interested in actually having like an affair with Hooper and she doesn't like like him. She just wanted it to be that one time thing and for him to fulfill this need in her. And then she was kind of done with it. <laughs> but to talk about Hooper. So yeah, he is a younger guy. He's like, I don't know. Hel Ellen seems like she was in her early 30s and Hooper is like 10 years younger. So he's in his early 20s. But yeah, he shows up because he knows a lot about sharks. And in the second half of the book and movie, he goes out on a boat with Brody and Quint and they're out there trying to hunt the shark. And in both, he ends up going down in a shark cage. But in the book, he does it because he wants pictures because he's like, man, like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for a shark this big. Like I need to get some pictures. And he also has like the stick thingy that he can like try to get the shark with. But it seems like in the book, it was mostly just for his own pride and his own desire to get these photos is why he ends up going down there and the shark breaks into the cage and he dies. Whereas in the movie, Hooper does go down in the shark cage, but it's for more noble reasons than the book because in the movie, he's not wanting to take pictures. He's just trying to kill the shark with this like injection thing he has. And so he doesn't do it out of pride or anything. But in the movie, the shark ends up breaking into the cage too, but Hooper doesn't die. Instead, he's able to escape out of the cage and he survives to the end of the movie, which funny enough, Enough, though in the original script Hooper was supposed to die in the cage but then the way they filmed the shark the cage scene they filmed it like different people were filming it in Australia with a real shark and so a lot of the scenes happened when the cage was empty and so Spielberg he just kind of rolled with it and he was like okay we'll have it so that Hooper escapes and then we can still use this footage of the shark with the empty cage and Hooper will just survive in the end so they made that change in the movie but it's kind of funny that it wasn't even intentional. And then I have to talk about Quint, who is a shark hunter who halfway through the book and movie, they realize like, we need to hire this guy because, you know, we need someone serious to catch this shark. And so uh, Brody gets the mayor to sign the paper that they agreeing that they will pay Quint. And in the movie, they are out on the boat 24 seven until they catch it. Whereas in the book, they would go out in the day, come back at night, go out again in the day, come back at night. And in the book they were paying Quint by the day but at some point it gets to a point where Quint he doesn't even care about the money because Brody it's been so many days and Brody's like I can't get the town to pay you any more money than we already have and Quint is like I don't care about the money anymore like I need to catch this shark and this is like a deeper personal reason than it was before and so now I don't even care about the money and so in some ways I have not read Moby Dick but in some ways the Quint uh, character did remind me of Ahab in certain ways based on what I've heard about Ahab. But yeah, Quint is such a great character in both book and movie. And in the movie, he's of course played by Robert Shaw, who was just amazing. And I read he was difficult to work with because he was an alcoholic, so that was sad. But we have the scene where he talks about how he was on the USS Indianapolis, which is a ship or a, I feel like there's a, a, it's not called a ship, it's like something more than that. But anyway, it crashed and like some of the people got eaten by sharks, but that it's like kind of fictionalized because the true story is that the sharks didn't kill anyone who wasn't already dead. But anyway, in this version, sharks like came and attacked. And so he is one of the few survivors. And so he says how he's never going to wear a life jacket again because he would rather drown than risk being eaten by a shark. And so it's a great monologue, but it was not in the book at all. And also <laughs> leading up to this monologue, it's a great part in the movie where they're all just kind of drinking and having fun and showing each other their scars. And there was just a lot of humor throughout this movie that kind of surprised me, but I'm getting ahead of myself because I was going to talk about that later. But anyway, 
Getting back to Quint. Um, in the book, there's parts where while they're trying to get the big shark, they catch smaller sharks and they end up cutting them open and tossing them back out to try to lure the big shark to them. And there's also a part where they have like this baby dolphin that they also use to lure the shark. So I did read people in reviews talking about like the animal violence. There's also a cat who dies in relation to the mafia stuff. So people to complain about the animal violence, which is kind of funny because it's like uh, a lot of people are killed in this too, but Apparently readers don't care about that. What they care about is the fact that some of the animals are killed. And on one hand, I get it why people are sensitive about animal death. But on the other hand, I'm like, so the animal death bothers you, but the death of the people don't? Like an 11 year old kid dies in this and that doesn't bother you as much as the death of the cat does? Like, okay. <laughs> but anyway. That wasn't in the movie though. We don't see them catch these smaller sharks. But basically to get back to Quint, uh, in the end of the movie, he ends up being eaten by the shark, which again is a powerful moment and sad moment and intense moment. But also because Quint, that is like his worst fear is to die that way. And that ends up what's that is what ends up happening to him. And he dies before the shark is killed. Whereas in the book, he is shooting the shark with a harpoon and then his leg gets caught in the rope. And so as the shark like, you know, dives back into the water, Quint is dragged along with him because he's tied to the rope and he ends up drowning as the shark, he like killed the shark and then his leg got tied. So as the shark is like going underwater, yeah, Quint is dragged behind him and he ends up drowning and that's how he dies. But to be honest, when I was reading this book, I finished like the last 40% of it when I was on a road trip. And so as I was listening to it, because I couldn't see how much was left, it seemed like the ending came so abruptly. And I was like, wait, what? It's already done already? And it could have been because I was driving, but I totally missed that the shark died. <laughs> I just thought Quint was trying to shoot the shark and I thought that he died in the process, but that the shark lived, but that for some reason the shark didn't attack Brody and Brody was able to swim to shore. And so that's how I thought it ended with the shark living. And it wasn't until after the fact I went back and physically read it and I was like, okay, so Quint killed the shark and then he died and then Brody sees them, you know, going into the ocean and then he comes up back on top of the water and he swims to shore and that's is how it ends. So yeah, what did feel pretty abrupt though, whereas in the movie, so Quint dies and then afterwards they have these oxygen tanks, which I had, I didn't know how this movie was going to end, but earlier on in the movie, there's a part where the oxygen tank falls and Hooper is like, Hey, watch out that, you know, that thing could explode. And right when that is happens, I knew then and there that this was like a Chekhov's gun moment and that those tanks would be used later to get the shark. And that is what happens. Brody ends up getting the oxygen tank in the shark's mouth. And then he's able to shoot the oxygen tank and it blows the shark up. And then after the shark is dead, Brody is like holding on to whatever he's holding on to with the boat, which is sinking. And then Hooper shows back up because Hooper is alive in the movie. And then the two of them, you know, have a back and forth and then they swim to shore. And so the movie does end very quickly after the climax, but in the book, it just felt so abrupt. Whereas the movie, maybe it felt less abrupt because he and Hooper have some dialogue back and forth and then they swim to shore. But yeah, in both, they don't waste any time. And as soon as the shark is dead, it comes to an end. <laughs> but to talk about just like some fun movie facts. So Jaws created the summer blockbuster because prior to this, movies were released over Christmas time and that is what they intended for Jaws, but the making of it took so long that it was pushed back to summertime. But at that time, this is 1975, the summer was thought of as being a time when everybody is outside. So they're like, we don't release big movies over the summer because no one's gonna see it. They're busy outside having fun. But people flocked to the theaters to see this movie and it was the first movie to ever make over 100 million in the box office. And ever since then, movies now come out, like the summer is now a popular movie release time. So that's pretty crazy. And also Benchley was in, like involved in the script writing process, but it seems like he was pretty stubborn about wanting to keep it closer to the book with the subplots and with the ending, he didn't like the shark being blown up. And so he ended up being fired, I guess, from the process because he was too adamant about, you know, his input. And then I also just wanted to point out how many cool shots there are in this movie and just a lot of great camera work and angles. And then there's a lot of funny moments too, which I kind of touched on earlier, but there's a part where Martin and Ellen, their son is in a boat, like just along the dock and Martin is freaking out and he's like, hey, get out of that boat, it's not safe. And Ellen, she's like, calm down. Like he's not in the water, he's on a boat, he's gonna be fine. And so Brody is like, he's calming down and he's like, uh, like you're right, you know, I'm just stressed, whatever. And while Brody is calming down, Ellen is lo looking at this book about sharks and she sees a picture where a shark bites into a, sh a boat on the bottom. And so so within like 60 seconds of her telling Martin to calm down, 
she calls out to her son being like, Michael, didn't you hear your father? Like, get in here right now. <laughs> and so that was just a funny scene. And then we also have the part where they first see the shark while they're out on the boat. And Hooper wants to get a picture of it. And so he's telling Brody to like stand out closer, like on the edge of the boat so that they can use Brody like to scale to see how big the shark is. And so it's just a funny moment when Hooper is like, no, like further, further out. And Brody is just like, what? Like, no, I'm not going out there. And yeah, so just I was surprised at the humor throughout this movie. And then, of course, we have the, the moment where Brody is putting Chum out into the water and then he looks away. And when he looks back, the shark is right there. And that's just such a great scene how like he just gets up so abruptly and so stiffly and then he just like is in shock as he walks back to tell Quint like you're gonna need a bigger boat and such an amazing scene. And also I gotta say I kind of think that if they had gotten a bigger boat maybe Quint would have lived right and maybe the cage wouldn't have broken too because it definitely seemed like that boat in particular just wasn't strong enough to deal with this shark and they had those thingies I forget what they're called now but basically yeah the boat was falling apart at times because of the strength of the shark so had they gotten a bigger boat maybe Quint would have lived and things would have played out a bit differently what do you think share your thoughts down in the comments but yeah, this movie, I felt like it just perfectly balanced like horror, suspense, comedy, drama. And then at other times there were just like some heartwarming, heartwarming, heartwarming moments as well. And definitely similar to Jurassic Park, right? Because Jurassic Park starts out like so magical and wonderful. And then at the halfway point, it becomes like a horror monster movie. Which speaking of Jurassic Park, I have covered a number of other Spielberg movies such as Jurassic Park and then also Catch Me If You Can and The Color Purple. So Spielberg does have quite the diverse filmography, even just with the ones that I've covered so far. But anyway, let's get into book versus movie. Which one wins? This is a tough call because I really do love both of them and I would highly recommend them both. But ultimately I gave the book four stars while I gave the movie five stars. Like I was trying to think of a reason to not give it five stars, but I just couldn't think of anything. This movie was just so good. I loved it so much. I think I'm gonna try to make a habit of watching this every summer from now on. And even like the shark itself, like the effects for the time, this was, how many years ago now 1975 over 40 years and yet it's really well done so i was very impressed and it, there weren't any times when i was taken out of the moment because of the effects then the acting by everyone is incredible and you know you have richard dreyfus dreyfus in this as well i forget the name of the guy who plays captain brody but yeah everybody was amazing i yeah i can't think of a single critique for this movie so i highly recommend it and it does win ultimately over the book. And I did think it was good that they took out those subplots, by the way, with the mafia and then Hooper and Ellen and all of that stuff. So the book also has a few weird racial, like offensive racial things as well. And so again, the movie doesn't have that though. So that is more props to the movie for getting rid of that stuff. But yeah, that wraps it up for my book first movie for Jaws. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I didn't get into like the nitty gritty details of the plot as you may have noticed. Uh, so if you have any questions about more specific details, you can comment down below and we can talk about it. And don't forget to like and subscribe and also give my podcast a rating and review. And if you enjoyed this one, you may also want to check out The Mist by Stephen King, which I covered. So I will link to it here if you're watching this on YouTube and you can go ahead and watch that one too. So thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel and I will see you next time. Bye.